what if the bike doesn't just have a motor in it, but also has like some sort of AI and a radio on it, and he wasn't talking to Van Aert, he was <laughs> talking to the bike. Ah, <laughs> Alexa, go faster. Is... <laughs> this is the 4D chess that, that Yumbo are playing at this point in time, and the rest of us just cannot keep up. Welcome back to the Placeholder Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. we got a great show for you today. Got a lot to talk about, actually. We have insight into Yumbo Visma's mystery bottles and the sort of purplish liquid that is being drank out of them. Jerome Pino thinks that Sepp Kuss has a motor. The NCL just laid off most of its riders, which is not great. And GCN, your favorite live television bike racing option is for sale we're hearing we're going to talk about that later in the show welcome to class johnny long present does that work wait that welcome was, to hey, class have you ever <laughs> school? that's not how the register's taken <laughs> no I, is, you literally, I, I thought the way i imagined it was like, you literally do exactly what you did before but johnny or i or kid or whatever just says here <laughs> uh i public school all the way i can sing okay. the pledge of allegiance end to end uh do you, do you guys have an equivalent of that in in the UK? Do you have like we a, don't do it like, in class? Do we do stand up? <laughs> no, of course we don't because we're America. normal. <laughs> <laughs> to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under no. God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can't talk because we did prayers because it was Catholic school, and that's all. My, that's the only <laughs> well, thing weirder yeah. than doing the American stuff. I mean, yeah, we had chapel four times a week. Yeah. That's cool. mm. Welcome to the show, Johnny Long. Present. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show, Kit Nicholson. Present. And welcome to the show, Ronan McLaughlin. Here. <laughs> We're going to get into it pretty quickly here today. But before we do, a quick thank you to some of our lifetime members. We love you very much. Big thanks to Dana Chen, Daniel Ford. Benoit C. Gautier, Todd Markels, and Arjen Hulsebos. And I do apologize if I've mispronounced any of your names. Massive thank you for being lifetime members of Escape Collective. If you're not any sort of member of Escape Collective, head over to escapecollective.com slash join. Members are how we fund this entire operation. So if you're a regular listener to this podcast or any of our other podcasts, you really should head over there. You can become a reader, which drops the paywall on the site for six ninety nine US dollars a month, or a full on member with Discord access and all the rest for eleven ninety nine US dollars per month, or save thirty percent and be a yearly member. Head over to escapecollective.com slash join right now. Please and thank you. Kaylee, I know that you're going to say that all those lifers aren't your neighbors, but I know for sure <laughs> that Benoit lives across the road on the right hand side. And he definitely gets funny about his bins, and it's a bit it's getting a bit tetchy down the street. That's my guess. Uh, he forgot to close his bear proof bin the other day, and it was knocked over, and trash was all over the street. Nightmare. Mm-hmm. That's I like true. that you have bear proof bins in Edinburgh. We have gull proof bags. Really? <laughs> yeah. What is sea, what is sea, <laughs> sea gull proof bin bin bags? Massive sacks made of this hardy uh, material. Yeah. There you go doesn't work either <laughs> <laughs> the bear proof ones don't either actually most of the time uh and there's a big bear that, that wanders down my alley every single night at about two o'clock in the morning it's about i don't know sort of shoulders are about like adult human waist height so is he heading out or heading home at two in the morning <laughs> i think he's heading home and on his way yeah. back he just knocks over every single trash bin in the entire alley drunk. J- just to see if they'll open and sometimes they do uh Good start to the pod today. Let's get into let's, <laughs> let's get into today's it's the third episode. week of a grand tour. That's it's why. the third week of grand tour. We're we're going a little bit crazy. Uh, we're going to kick off with some some really unfortunate news, uh, but obviously bears mentioning. Nathan Van Hoydonk was involved in a car accident on Tuesday. Uh, Johnny, w- what happened here? This he's it's, he's in pretty bad shape, right? Yeah, it, um, it was 8.30 in the morning. He was driving his pregnant wife, who was in the passenger seat, and they were stopped at traffic lights on an intersection. And 
they believe at the moment, obviously, by the time you're listening to this, you'll know a lot more about what happened. But apparently he sort of fell seriously ill. It might have been like a heart attack or something. Uh, and then his sort of foot then went on the accelerator and then he just zoomed across the intersection and crashed into like five other cars. Um, everyone, like other people in other cars were treated for minor injuries, like just scratching the scrapes for the most part. But Van Hooydonk was resuscitated at the scene by a nurse and then taken to Antwerp Hospital. And it all sounds, it, well, who knows? It, sound, it sounds really bad. There's a bit more encouraging news now because while he is in an induced coma, uh, they don't believe he suffered any brain damage. So it's still quite a critical condition. Um, but the the latest report that we're hearing at Tuesday at 4 p.m. is that the people in the hospital with him are more hopeful than they were previously. But yeah, very, very mm. shocking and worrying story. Yeah, really unfortunate. Um, well, we wish all the best to, to Nathan and his whole family and... and- Hope everybody comes out of that all right. Again, we don't have a ton of information right now. We just wanted to wanted to mention it right up top. Uh, it always feels a bit weird to talk about something like that and dive straight back into bike racing, mm-hmm. uh, which you know just feels quite inconsequential after after a story like that. But that is what we are here to talk about. So. <laughs> Brief update on the Vuelta. Uh, if you want a much deeper dive on the Vuelta and, and for example, a much deeper dive on the question of, of can Sepkus actually take this thing all the way to the line, head over to the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast. But let's get a little Vuelta update. Where do we stand right now with, uh, well, half a week to go in the year's final Grand Tour? Yeah, so uh, not much has changed as far as the general classification at the very top, the very top. Um, it's, it remains the Jumbo Visma show, and that was never more apparent than on Friday's stage to the Col du Tourmalet, um, won by Jonas Vingigo, and then second and third place was Sepkus and Primoz Roglic. So from that point onwards, they've been uh, completely taking over the podium. Um, what also happened on Friday, though, was that Remco Evenepoel dropped precipitously out of contention, and yet it has remained the Remco Evenepoel show, this Vuelta, which has been... Um, well, it, on Friday it was it was quite sad to see him drop so far out of contention, but uh, he had bounced back with pretty sensational fashion over the weekend, in what seemed to be a combination of proving himself to, well, the Belgian media public, the fans, the race, his team, and I think even more than anything himself. Um, stage win on Saturday when he just rode everyone off his wheel after doing nearly all the work. And uh, in the breakaway to sweep up some more KOM points um, on Sunday. So that's his new goal, is the King of the Mountains, Mm. with one week to go. You read a great piece about Remco over the weekend, Kit. I really enjoyed it. Uh, And sort of the, the, I don't know, the the, the kind of, the way that we look at athletes and in those sort of bad moments uh, and how we kind of project upon them and things like that. I think that Remco over the weekend was a really fascinating kind of case study in the way that fans react to, well, a very, very, very bad day on the bike, right? Taking himself completely out of out of overall contention and then a bit of a redemption arc within about forty eight hours. Uh, it was a it was a fascinating weekend of bike racing and a fascinating weekend for Remco. And I don't I think that the uh, the initial reaction is to try to like take something out of it. Right, it's like okay, well, what do we learn from this? What do we is is Remco Evenepoel not actually a GC contender? Like th- those sort of questions start to pop up, and I thought your piece, uh, in a very nuanced way, made made a, a great point that like th- that those sort of questions at this point in time are probably not uh, not the most helpful thing in the world, and also uh, like a completely ridiculous sort of extrapolation off of actual events, right? Yeah, I think. Um... As we so often have to remind ourselves, especially with Sepkus at the moment, is everyone's different, and some people will react differently to circumstances um, and to the rules, so-called, of modern cycling. You know, somebody doesn't do three Grand Tours back to back and win the third, if he does, obviously. But the same goes with Evenepoel. Is there are all these expectations for him, um, especially looking ahead to the Tour de France next year when he's expected to face off with Vingigo and Pogacar. Um, so yeah, this is this seems like a big blow to that GC discussion, 
But there's the question mark over how bad his day was on Friday. Obviously, it was bad enough to be out of GC. There's no doubt about that. But was it what happened between being four minutes off the back and being 27 minutes off the back? Um, that's a you have to dig deep into mental reserves there. And I think we've seen Evan Apple do that an awful lot. And he always seems to learn something from it. Um, he's someone who seems to have a very fast learning curve. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing for his GC ambitions. I'm still, like I said in the piece, sceptical as to whether he's ready right now to be spoken about among those top riders on the, you know, in July. But I have more faith in his ability to make a plan and make it happen at some point in his career because he keeps having these, he keeps proving to everyone that he actually does learn um, from the mistakes or the bad performances that he sometimes rarely puts out. Yeah, we were kind of joking that Patrick Lefebvre should have should have sold him to Ineos before the Vuelta because it probably didn't do a ton of favors for his sort of GC value, uh, I would say. But that's sort of neither here nor there. But internally, actually, I, I heard recently that uh, the, the latest from that camp is that Lefebvre is incredibly keen to hang on to him and is actually doing everything he possibly can to to do so. Um, so you're saying that he, stops, he tanked so Remco at the Vuelta? <laughs> he just yeah he, he 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 didn't give him his little uh bottle of purple juice after yep. the previous no stage. dinner and then what, what are they gonna do no dinner for him uh speaking of which we have we have the answer to a question that came in from a listener uh and actually it's been sort of we've been peppered with this question over the last couple of weeks because or even though most of the season because it's something that people keep noticing and that we have noticed and we wanted to dig into and find an answer for it. And the question was basically, there's these little kind of like translucent bottles, tr- possibly transparent bottles, with some kind of purple liquid in them. Uh, what are they? <laughs> and and r- riders riders are often handed them after the finish. Uh, we've seen them like fall out of pockets, for example. Uh, things that like 15 years ago would have set off many 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 alarm bells uh even even more recently than that i would say like up until the point where uh some of the finished bottle like tramadol stuff w- was was effectively banned uh you know would have set off a lot of a lot of alarm bells as it was less alarm bells and more just kind of like what is that and we were very curious johnny you have done a bit of digging on this and well the, the official answer is pretty innocuous right yeah, first of all, sorry, because I realized too late you were doing a perfect segue with the purple bottles into the, the story. <laughs> but what's done is done, and we can't go back now, much like Remco Evan and Paul's Walter. Anyway, Yumbo Visma and their, their purple bottles. So we went to Yumbo Visma and asked, we, we did some Googling on uh, online, and we're like, what is this? And there were a couple of people suggesting cherry juice, and then we had a, our own sort of text thread going of like, is it cherry juice? What What's going on? Here's the official line from the Yumbo Visma nutritionist. I won't do a Dutch accent, but you can imagine it in Dutch accent if you want. Cherry juice contains, first of all, a decent amount of carbohydrates that are the most important priority in acute recovery after a hard stage. Next to that, the cherries we're using are rich in a specific nutrient, a certain polyphenol, which is like a micronutrient I googled, um, that are like present in loads of fruit and veg and other things. Um, That helps to reduce slash recover muscle damage. Finally, just because it's half a litre of fluids, it helps to replenish sweat loss, which is also a very important step in recovery. I'm I'm watching Ronan's face while this has been read out, and I'm I'm ready to be hit in the face with the analysis and be told that I've been half lied to. Um, uh, well, I think we should clarify first of all. I think that answer res- refers specifically to the bottles that the writers are getting after the finish line handed yeah. to them from this one year so we 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 yeah. don't actually have an answer on the bottles that we see in writers pockets and stuff yeah. from time to time but uh, I, don't, I don't think that was the initial question i mean that was just as i started rambling and <laughs> getting loads of stuff off my chest we ended up talking about random bottles and back pockets but yeah anyway um that remains a mystery <laughs> that remains a mystery um and the cherry just is something that i've uh, a handful of people had me- messaged me on Instagram and stuff after last week's podcast to say that the writers are taking cherry juice and it kind of when someone first suggested that it, it 
it was it kind of it was one of those to me all oh, right okay well why now because i know cherry active juice and stuff like that was like something writers myself included were taking like 10 years ago to aid sleep i think um and, and i wasn't really aware of its recovery powers but then kit you had some uh understanding of the benefits in terms of recovery that the cherry just offers and when i went back then to try and find whatever research i had seen 10 years ago about how to aid sleep i had uncovered quite a lot of stuff about improving endurance performance and different studies suggesting that it uh aids recovery also um unfortunately some of those studies were funded by the manufacturers who are producing this stuff so um question take those with, take those with <laughs> an ounce of cherry or salt uh, either way um but um yeah kit you know a bit more about this so i'm going to throw it across to you yeah i mean the the sleep what uh element is an interesting one because i think there's a bit of doubt as to well well the sleep and it being lumped together with the performance enhancing properties potential you know, we talked about beets and various other fruits that are supposed to have some sort of, I don't know, benefit throughout the ride, throughout the day, that sort of thing. As far as cherries and sleep is concerned, there's an understanding that that does, especially tart cherry juice, because it's got more melatonin than the more um, sweet cherries. It is, you know, melatonin is something that we all have heard of, right? It helps you get sleep. And then, of course, if you have more sleep efficiency, you have more energy. So your performance is probably going to be better. But it's not directly because of the cherries. Now, as far as recovery, um, it's a, it's an inflammation and a muscle strain thing. Um, it I, I read a study, I was, ref, I was refreshing my memory uh, on the inflammation subject because I've been told over the years uh, that it's got these properties that are better than things like uh, I don't know spinach and tomatoes it's got these higher levels a high concentration of um, various antioxidants um, and uh, well essentially supposedly and this wasn't a brand funded uh, article or research project but apparently uh, tart cherries specifically sour cherries um, over the course of a few months of uh, having them in your diet can reduce um, biological markers for inflammation by 25%, which is pretty significant. So if that's, you know, if you're doing, and so it's especially in older people, it's used quite often, it's advised quite often with arthritis and you can get cherry supplements in tablet form now. Um, but yeah, so it's, I think what they're doing is they are getting off the bike, especially in a really hard day, they're reducing muscle strain as much as they possibly can. And also over a long period of time, they're getting their bodies used to lower levels of inflammation or, mm. or lowering inflammation. As for the question of how, why they do, drink it so damn fast, if it's sour cherries, I, I used to drink a lot of sour cherry juice. Um, it's quite sour um, and, you're not, and you don't want to add sugar because sugar, well, it's also got its own carbohydrate um, properties and it's, it does good in other ways but if you're if you want everything you can get out of sour cherries you get it down you because it doesn't taste great and then you move on to the i don't know the cookies and cream uh recovery shake <laughs> um so yeah i don't know i think that's a bit of a ramble but it's and it's also something that's tricky to really um pinpoint what is it the cherries or is it something else but that's 25 percent is the number it supposedly uh, gets to I mean, yeah, the, them drinking it so quickly is why it's become like a story, even if it's like an old explanation of what it is. And it's also because it's in those weird, well, not weird, completely normal plastic bottles, but that in context of a bike race are weird. And so we asked that as well of the team of why they're they're just drinking out of like, like they've picked it out of like a rubbish bin. Um, and the answer is it's partly water, like already in the mixture, which is already in the water bottles. So I guess like the soigneurs are just like down in half of the bottle and they don't want to waste extra bead-ons and on a bike you need those bottles but normally after the finish line you don't need those sorts of bottles anymore. Well, if it's the same sort of uh, thing that, you know, it, it, if you think about any sort of squash, concentrated squash, you really don't need very much. I think the it, it was uh, okay. something like 10 milliliters of concentrated cherry juice. So I, I imagine that they're literally just, you know, cracking the seal on the bottle, pouring yeah. in the sachet, shaking it up and they're done. Um, okay. So uh, when I saw that, I thought, well, that's hilariously obvious. 
Um, and mm. as cycling journalists, we have expected it to be such, so much bigger than it actually is. Literally, it's just water in a bottle of water that we've added something to. Uh, and cycling teams are notoriously famous for saving bidons wherever possible also like they, you would never see a team throwing away a, a bidon to get to your point yeah, there exactly Johnny, right them not one <laughs> that, that, that part of the explanation was like it was that part that had me questioning all of the rest of the explanation <laughs> yeah for e, for, i guess for ease I don't know, yeah but um yeah the final th- i guess and it adds dan martin was uh talking the other day about about Jumbo Visma's dominance and that sort of thing. And someone asked him, like, oh, are you not suspicious, da 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 and he's like, No, like I want to I want to trust and believe, but they definitely do have like a couple of little tricks that other people haven't cottoned on to, which I guess makes sense and maybe this isn't gonna be the answer, but like you don't see other teams drinking out of these water bottles like this. I, I was gonna say the opposite actually. I I thought it was just when I, we were talking about it last week, I was just I was sort of talking water wide rather than okay. specifically about Yombo Visma. Um, they think, just win know. a lot, Johnny. So we see them drinking it more than anything. Yeah, else. exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Oh, that maybe that's the reason. Maybe Arkea Samsung are also doing the same thing, but it, they're just not got the cameras on them after the stage. <laughs> All right, so we've solved one mystery. Uh, other mysteries remain, of course, as is always the case. Uh, but this one seems relatively, like I said, relatively innocuous. I don't think, uh, I don't think there's any, any real reason to not believe them. <laughs> and and as you said, Ronnie, sort of, it is it's across a lot of the world tour. So, yeah, I think it's just refreshing that the answer is literally just it's in your fruit bowl, guys. It, it's really simple. We're just eating food, and it works. It That's saves good. our energy. I think it would probably differ greatly as well from what they do in training. Uh, if they if they're looking for an anti anti-inflammatory response, that would be that would obviously be desirable during a stage race when you want to recover as quickly as possible. But uh, that's less desirable in training because it, uh, some studies have shown that anti-inflammatories can actually hamper your uh, training response or your training stimulus. Um, so it's you know it's. Obviously, they do it in a race at the finish line. Um, it's kind of, it, it's very obvious to us. But I, I first of all doubt they're doing it in training, and I doubt they think it's all that big a secret. Because if they did, they, they would probably us. do it on the team bus where yeah. it wouldn't be visible. I, I don't think the difference between the finish line and five minutes later in, in privacy somewhere would would be make or break in terms of whether this works or not. I'd like if they threw like a big sheet over their heads and then they downed the bottle and then they it off again. <laughs> like a Scooby-Doo type incident. Just bring a big screen. Yeah, or like those, old, those old fashioned cameras where you have to like duck under to like see the, mm. for the darkness. Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, speaking of superb conspiracy theories that we really love to engage with, uh, Jerome Pino, uh, the former team manager, uh was on french radio was it over the weekend i believe yeah. and made some somewhat inflammatory remarks uh about yumbo visma and this old uh this old ringer here motors in their bicycles so what did he say first and foremost and then we could chat about it he was on a show someone commented on the spin cycle we were chatting about it and um the show's called something like people with big mouths so it's kind of like a shock jock sort of like the I, british the british listeners will understand it's like the french talk sport from what it sounds like i don't know what your guys equivalent is um like a sporting alex jones for american listeners um mm. anyway he he was basically talking about yombovism's dominance and in so many words even though he wouldn't actually come out and say it which kind of if you're gonna say it say it that Jumbo Visma were had like motors because they in four pedal strokes they would go ten meters more and all this stuff and then making like weird analogies to like the opening stage of Paranese last year but instead of saying that he said like it was to the west of a certain region of France and like an eight hundred meter climb. It took me ages to figure out. I was uh, by the end I was like, you know what, Jerome Pino, <laughs> like enough. Enough, all right. Um but yeah, just quite strong and you don't really get this sort of talk from anyone like within the cycling world 
or at least anyone who maybe he's just given up on like having a job within cycling again i don't know after the whole men in glass fiasco with the uh the mark cavendish project and the women's team um but yeah basically accused sep curse and the whole all of them of using motors it was pretty wild maybe this explains the whole the whole team failing last winter and you know perhaps that can be just told him he was going to sign for a team east of britain and (laughs) 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 yeah we we, jumped to conclusions and uh, yeah we'd assumed all the like the men in do you remember when they used to do like the men in glass like on the website like the description of the color of the sea and stuff and we assumed it was just some like half cut like martin (laughs) officer but it was actually just jerome pino like after a few glasses just going on going off on one but yeah what a nuts guy he was not on the he was not on the shortlist of the guys you think would accuse like, i think he probably beat like antoine veyer to the punch with this one which is really saying something and uh richard plugger's response so that's the yumba visma boss mm. um he uh he said something along the lines of jaron pino hasn't got any right to talk about modern cycling he doesn't have a clue or something like that. Um, so after the fiasco there was last last uh, autumn, um, yeah, it's uh, it was quite salty, but it was good. All right. So a uh, big important question I want to ask all three of you is: Sepp Kuss riding with a motor in his bicycle? What do we think? I don't <laughs> think he. he may- <laughs> I'm, I'm not willing to Very comment well on whether or not he has a motorbike at home but or an e-bike uh, I, for that I just don't know yeah, or yeah. an e-bike but um, I, I mean like, uh, obviously none of us actually know the answer to this uh, I think it's highly unlikely uh, it, I was going to say unfortunately is our job to like actually at least look into these things uh, and the videos that I have seen circulating as evidence that he has a motor in it there's just nothing abnormal looking about it those it looks like an attack on a mountain it looks like an attack where the group isn't going full gas he's at the back mass has dropped back a bit and he attacks from behind the group that doesn't see him attacking and he then gets a jump on them and ayoso is in the front of the group and he actually does respond to kus's attack and it you know he is able to accelerate also but Kuss has such a jump on him that Ayuso's attack just can't match Kuss's. I also think, and and uh, Pino had mentioned about the spectator stepping out in front of him. I think had Kuss had a motor in his bike at that point, he wouldn't have. Surely he wouldn't have been able to slow down, or he, <laughs> <laughs> it would have back kicked, or something would have. Uh, you know, there surely he wouldn't have been able to avoid a crash in that in that scenario. Then, so uh, I don't know. Just, I hate this topic. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I just it, it pops up a couple times a year. It, it's generally some like sort of strange, semi ostracized individual like Jerome Pino, and uh, it, it 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 the problem is there's been one right. We've got the the Femke van den van den Dreisch, uh, issue. Uh, well, where they found an actual motor in a cyclocross racer's bike a couple years ago, right? Um, so there's been one, and that's the, the sort of thing that keeps these things chugging along. Uh, I tend to believe that, like, you can rationalize doping as yourself but better. You can't rationalize a motor, right? And I don't think – I think you'd have to be pretty kind of sociopathic to to, to, to go down that particular route. Um it's not just that you need to be sociopathic. You need multiple sociopaths on the team mm. to make yeah. it happen. Yeah. Uh, so and sociopaths within the bike brand and the sociopath who's developed the motor and yeah. yeah like it's just the whole thing. It it it, it it's very implausible. Uh, and also, yeah, there's just no evidence. So anyway, well, let's leave this aside. We thought it was uh, silly and worth mentioning, and mostly because we wanted to to tell you that Jerome Pino is is being kind of an idiot here also you wouldn't have had grisha nearman uh calling wat van Aert a motorbike for the whole tour de france because <laughs> that you just wouldn't oh, yeah. do that you wouldn't be that obvious would, or maybe you would and then what if the bike doesn't just have a motor in it but also has like some sort of aa and a radio on it and he wasn't talking to van Aert, he was <laughs> talking to the bike uh, <laughs> alexa is, go faster 
<laughs> this is the 4D chess that, that Yumbo are playing at this point in time, and the rest of us just cannot keep up. Uh, speaking of 4D chess, <laughs> just just right now, while we were making this podcast, and again, this is it's Tuesday, uh, September 12th, Stage of the Wealth just finished up. Uh, we think this is worth mentioning because it's relevant. Jonas Vingago just attacked his teammate, Sepkus, and took a whole bunch more time out of him. It did look like a p- perhaps a, a Van Hoydonk uh, tribute of some sort. Uh, yeah, Vingago was quite emotional at the finish. But still, I-, I feel like I can't be the one to say it here as the American in the room. Um, I'll say it. Yeah, you say it, Johnny. Look, this is obviously a Sepkus podcast, and sometimes we've been critical of Jumbo Visma for various things, but like we don't have anything against them. But attacking your teammate in the red jersey after you've won two Tours de France in a row, and the guy in the red jersey was crucial in winning you them, can you not let him have a Vuelta? Like the Vuelta is for like in the past Primoz Roglic who lost the Tour, so he won the Vuelta. But and I know people be like, oh well, you know, you're, they have to be competitors, and there are no gifts, and da da da. But in cycling, sometimes there, there are, are gifts. gifts. And if if you're in the team together, like when Wout van Aert's given Laporte pretty sizable victories, you can let Sepp Kuss have one Vuelta. The the strange thing though was, and it could be an act. Uh, it wouldn't need to be if there actually was a problem, like you're sort of suggesting they're joining with them attacking Sep, but Sep just looks delighted for Jonas still that you know they're hugging and celebrating and smiling and laughing and I don't I, are, are they that in control that they can put Vigigo within 30 go seconds and then leave tomorrow. him there <laughs> or either that or they the Angleru is so tough that they know Vinigo is going to ride away with it anyway but he doesn't have well, to it's like, good for. And I know he good... doesn't have to, but I mean, like Froome, Froome didn't beat Wiggins. I mean, he tried to, kind of. <laughs> Sorry, Kit. No, but Fr- mm. Froome was pulled back uh, in that 2012 tour. Yeah, like I he, think he was... I think that's yeah, that's very different. There was a direct order from the team. You wait. Because... Why are they not ordering Vingago? Like, yeah, there, I mean, there are a couple of things to. I, I don't disagree that it was weird that he's, especially he's taking what I think is about a minute sixteen back, which means yeah, he's got. He's got a that's, 29 that's a, second gap now. That's yeah, a sizable seconds. margin. And yes, he was he doesn't need to at, he doesn't need to attack to soften up anybody else because they've got the red jersey in the team. Um but you know, there were for once actually quite a lot of responses today. Um so to try and soften up their competitors for tomorrow, maybe they've got a plan to put Sep Kuss way out ahead tomorrow because I think the Angler is a sort of stage that he would excel on right that sort of high altitude climb he he is an altitude guy um so maybe they're p- making us ask these questions and making us ask is sepkus off making the other teams ask is sepkus off it was also i think inevitable that yumba visma if the guys felt like they could they were going to try and do something today for their teammate in belgium um so i don't disagree that it's the the way that it was done you know he could have or Roglic could have gone for it in the last kilometre. We know that Roglic has got a punch. Um, so they could have won the stage in a different manner. But um, yeah, it's, I think there's a lot to a lot to unpick and it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, suddenly Vingigo is the one. Well, the, the thing is, uh, by the time you listen to this, you probably know. <laughs> That's <laughs> also true. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't, which we don't, of course. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but we were just sort of reacting to that in real time because it was happening. At, at which point it will also be boring. Once right. we know the end. This is, this is most exciting right now. <laughs> Unless Kit's so going to in, most, most intriguing right now. We're, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to assume that, that Yumbo Visma is just in such control that they were like, all right, We'll give Vingigo a bit a bit more gap between him and Ayuso or whoever it is, uh, just to make sure if anything weird happens on the on the Angleru that we're fine. But man, if 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 he ends up taking red off his off his own teammate who's worked his butt off for him in multiple tours to France, on like the final day that that is possible to do it, that is basically all of America is going to hate hate Yumbo Visma forever. If they didn't already, uh, 
<laughs> Not that maybe they don't care. Yumbo doesn't sell groceries in America, so I don't know. Well, Yumbo care. doesn't doesn't won't be on the team jersey next year either. Oh yeah, but, but they must know that as well. Though. Surely they know Surely that Sepp has got to be the winner if he can. Surely but anyway, they know I'm that. hoping this is the start of uh, the like the butterfly effect that leads Sepp Kuss to not renew after next season. Then he joins UAE Team Emirates and helps Pogacar finally beat Vingo at the tour. <laughs> That'd be sweet. Silence. I don't think he will. No. I think if I think if it was anybody else, they would be like incredibly pissed off. But I think Sepp will probably just sort of. Why not? I want him to be angry. Keep going. Keep going. He's not an angry man. He's just not an angry man. Yeah. Anyway, we we already spent too much time in this because by the time you listen, yeah. you will have much more information than we actually have. We have a lot more to talk about today. Oh yeah, we do. We are going to take a quick break. Okay, we are back with another reader, reader, listener question. You can't read a podcast. Uh, we had a bunch of we had a question about the, uh, this is a great question. I love this. About the Garmin watches that are, we think, given to riders for the podium, right? They always have the same thing on them. First of all, what was the question and what's the answer? Uh, the question came in on the Discord from Solomon. You can only access the Discord if you remember. Um, he asked... Uh, I'll just it's, I'll I'll start reading it out until we get the gist of it. Uh, Solomon writes: My question is: Are all the riders on Garmin-sponsored teams using the exact same fake watch when they are on the hot seat or go into the podium? I noticed at the tour that Jonas Vingago, when he's not dropping his teammate in the red jersey, uh, always had a white forerunner nine five five. But the bizarre thing is that it's always set on the solar intensity page, and there is always a nice, pretty graphic, despite the fact that none of them wear it while racing. Um, the cynic in me thinks it's just a show model that gets passed around, but even so, I wonder if they only have it for Grand Tours or if there are a bunch of them just floating around. Uh, that's the gist of it. Um, Ronan, you had some immediate thoughts that we then followed up and actually asked the teams about. Yeah, you messaged me asking me this question why there was uh, cutting the grass. Yeah. The grass. The grass. The grass. <laughs> Um, fun fact about Ronan's grass cutting uh, is that when he sent me a picture of it, it was almost like a football pitch. He had like really straight sort of lines on it. Like mm. as fastidious as he is with his saddle height and his bike maintenance, the same goes for his lawn. <laughs> so I, I sent you back. Uh, I didn't. I had seen the teams recently or the riders on the podium recently wearing these uh, multi-sport watches, either from Garmin or Wahoo or from whoever. Um, and I'd sort of seen the, that as a growing trend. I'd noticed it happened a few times where it didn't previously happen. You know, Garmin have been making watches for as long as they've been making head units, I think, and the writers didn't used to wear watches on the podium, but they have done of late, and I guess it makes sense. Like, it's another way It's another, it's another way to get another sponsor onto the podium. It's probably something copied from Formula 1 as well. The difference with Formula 1 is that they're wearing 500,000 euro watches and not... Um, uh, multi-sport watches but anyway um and i didn't know any more than that but when you asked this question i thought of the way those watches and head units are delivered with like a screen protector that has a display printed on it and i presume that much like the swanier on the finish line will have fresh team clothing a team cap cherry um, juice cherry juice everything the rider needs before they go to the podium um, they probably also now stuff one of these watches into the podium bag, um, which will be you know the same bag for for every rider going to the, the podium. Um, and because it's not a watch that's actually used, it's only for podium duties. It probably just has never had that sticker removed. I would say partially just because it never needed to come off and partially because actually maybe Garmin or Wahoo or whatever want it left on because it shows a display but I would say that's why it's always in the same screen because it's not actually on a screen it's a it's a screen protector sticker thing that is also a, 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 a display of what you will see on the screen yeah that's pretty much what the the teams well the people we spoke to told us that it's just part of the podium bag and they they keep it on 
with the sticker and they said some of their guys rather than occasionally I don't, mean, I don't pay that much attention but what Solomon also asked uh, was he noticed that Primoz Roglic doesn't wear the Garmin and doesn't know and like he's like what's up with that does he have his own deal um, don't know I would presume that he did so much heavy lifting with the Morton's video sponsorship thing <laughs> early in the season that that was his get out of jail, jail card to not have to wear the fake watch on the podium it's most likely because I, I think I think we just cracked this answer as well. You're you're two for the price of one here on oh. today's podcast. Um, <laughs> it seems like Primus Roglic is a Tiso ambassador. Oh, um, because when I've googled him on the podium, he is uh, on the podium at this year's Giro, um, pink jersey and the never-ending trophy in his hand. So it must be the final podium with the Yumbo Visma hat. Uh, Oakley glasses and a Tisa watch. So mm, there we go. That tells me um, he probably doesn't wear the Garmin watch. I, I would love to see the team just force him to put a Garmin watch on the other wrist. Double watch. <laughs> mm. Roglic's Tisa watch is is Peter Sagan's ski goggles. Mm. Yeah, mm. I like the ski goggles. That was a good vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Call us Scooby Doo. We're solving mysteries left and right. Like I said, if you would like, if you have a mystery, you would you would like us to to answer or at least attempt to. One, you can hit us on Discord if you are a member. And just for clarity's sake here, so we do have we have sort of two tiers of membership, right? We have the the reader tier and the member tier. Yeah, re- readers can read about mysteries. Uh, and listen to them guilt-free, but members can pose mysteries to be solved. Exactly. So you have to be a, in a member tier to get access to the to our private Discord. Uh, so if you are a member, and not just a reader, and not just a nothing at all, you can hit us up on Discord with your mysteries to be solved. You can also send us uh, an email, johnny.long at escapecollective.com. That's J-O-N-N-Y, no H. Although... I think we decided we're gonna we're gonna set up a a version of the email with an H in it and just forward uh, because we think a lot of emails are going there. Anyway, email us your mystery, and again, if you're gonna email us, you got to include your member number because that's how we know that you're a member, and we do check. So if you've got a mystery for us, pop it on over. We're gonna take another quick break. Hey there. I'm Dane Cash. You may have seen my byline over at escapecollective.com, and I'm also a podcast host, and I'm taking the opportunity provided by this little break in the action of the podcast you're listening to right now to tell you that if you like bike racing and you want some pretty serious analysis, you should check out the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast. Every week, I chat with my co-host, Cosmo Catalano, and a few other extremely talented analysts, and we break down all the big stories in the pro racing scene. You hear from former road pros like Abby Mickey, Ruth Winder, and Rona McLaughlin, and from insightful cycling journalists like Kaylee Fretz, Johnny Long, and Kit Nicholson. We try to dive deep into the racing action to talk tactics, smart moves by some riders, questionable decisions by others, unheralded members of the pro peloton, and a lot more. And despite my best efforts to keep us very serious, you can rely on Cosmo and the rest of our crew to keep the serious level down just to where it's it's just pretty serious, the, the perfect amount of serious. You can find the pod on the main Escape Collective podcast feed, and we hope you'll check it out. All right, back to the show. Welcome back, everybody. We're going we're gonna to open up with some great news here while we were recording. It sounds like uh, Nathan Van Hoydonk woke up. He is awake. So uh, if you missed that on the Vuelta coverage on Tuesday, yeah, he's, he's doing better, which is what we like to hear. We've got a couple more news items today that we want to chat through. Before we get into that, just as you're saying that, it's kind of just, I'd already thought about it earlier today, but just thinking about whatever about the team, if you're a fan of them or not, but for those riders who are human at the end, they having to line up and race the stage of the Vuelta today, not mm-hmm. knowing what condition Van Hoedonk was in. Like the, you know, he, he's a guy who would have spent three weeks on the road in France with a lot of these guys as recently as just over a month ago. Um, for Tour Britain team, you know, I don't think any of them were racing today, but um, obviously they spent all of last week with them. Um, yeah, that's it's yeah, rough. Not, yeah, yeah. 
So whatever about dropping red jerseys, winning stages, whatever it kind of, yeah. Again, it, it, yeah, it puts, puts mm. things in perspective in this sort of, uh, yeah, just the inconsequential nature of a lot of what we talk about on this podcast, which is something that we struggle with on occasion. And actually, I would say we struggle with quite frequently. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, we enjoy being your ear friends over here and talking a bit of nonsense and talking important things when we need to. So that's what we'll continue to do. We've got a couple more news stories today. Uh, two bits of news. Uh, actually, we broke both these stories this week. One, we're going to start with the the NCL. We'll keep this one quite short. Um, the NCL, which is the National Cycling League, is this sort of like big money. Well, maybe not. Maybe not quite so big money. Big Money Crit League was was basically the idea behind it. Launched this year. They were supposed to have four races, ended up having three. Sort of this franchise team model. You all know what this is, I think, uh, at this point. Anyway, they, on Monday night, uh, they, in a mass video, laid off approximately 20 of their 32 riders across two teams. So they have two teams, the Miami Knights and the Denver Disruptors. Uh, they laid off 20 of those riders. Those riders are essentially you know, contract terminated without pay. Um, NCL did paid sort of decently well by kind of domestic racing standards uh and now we've got 20 riders completely out of a job and unfortunately you know halfway through the kind of transfer season that happens in cycling and a lot of teams are, are locking up their rosters and and now we've got 20 riders who are well potentially unable to to find new work which is really really unfortunate uh not a whole lot to sort of unpack here other, other than uh this project had you know a lot of promise born in f the finances of it basically they were talking about a million dollar prize purse and, and really sort of like huge celebrities behind it kevin durant just put money in like a month ago uh and this is a somewhat sort of unceremonious end to the season for them i should say that they have just announced that they're going to create some new team for 2024 they're spinning it a little bit um but there's no question that laying off 20 of your riders right as the season is sort of about to end who are expecting to be paid to the end of the year uh, it's not a good sign for the future of this organization again i don't want to spend too much time on this particular topic it's really unfortunate for all the riders um you know, these are these are some of them are, are sort of near the end of their career, um, but a lot of them aren't. Like a lot of them were, were sort of you know up and coming. Um, some of the good news, like Riley Sheehan, for example, was was riding. I think he was riding for Denver and and just signed with uh, Israel, which is great. Like so, so it has been an actually uh, occasionally been a success story from a um, kind of development standpoint. And again, I don't want to root against people trying to do things in, in particularly, you know, sort of American bike racing that, that needs a bit of help, but, um, just don't be a dick. Just, a good sign. just don't be a dick about it. And I'm going to leave it at that. I think, uh, we have one other kind of interesting news bit for this week. Um, and this has been a rumor that's been floating around for some time, but we got some sort of firmer information on it again on around Monday, uh, published a story on it on Tuesday, so it's up by the time you're listening to this podcast. Uh, and it's relevant because I think a lot of us, well, a lot of us consume a heck of a lot of bike racing television via the Global Cycling Network or GCN Plus, the app, the GCN Plus app, right? Uh, GCN is owned by a company called Play Sports Network, which also owns GMBN, the, the, the mountain bike side and the triathlon one and, you know, various other languages they've like gcn spanish and stuff like that um all part of play sports network which is owned by warner discovery uh the massive 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 media conglomerate that includes like discovery channel and and they bought Eurosport and all the rest uh play sport network is according to our sources for sale uh which is particularly interesting because one of the big questions that is not yet answered for me is whether that sale would potentially include the TV rights that GCN currently utilizes to bring us all this live coverage. The TV rights, of course, are owned by Discovery, not owned by Play Sports Network. And so if Play Sports Network gets spun off and gets sold to somebody, then where do those TV rights go? Do they go back to Eurosport? Do we watch bike racing on Discovery Plus? Like, how, what does that end up looking like? So for, for I think sort of the broader audience out there, it's a it's an interesting 
and and maybe somewhat concerning question because I do genuinely think that GCN is is they do the best English language race sort of television race coverage on the planet right now. They're certainly doing a better job than than Flow Sports. Uh, they're I would say doing a better job than NBC here in the states. They do a good job, so that's concerning. The other interesting side of this is that <laughs> the two. Two of a couple, uh, we think there are there are a number of buyers essentially sort of floating around, potential buyers sort of floating around us at the moment. One is Simon Ware, the original founder of GCN back in 2012. Um, Simon sold the last bits of the company in 2021 to Discovery, valuing the whole thing at about 70 million uh, British pounds. Uh, so he's apparently, according to our sources, poking around a little bit. Uh, I know Simon quite well, and 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 I texted him and have not received a response as of yet. Um, the other one, and this is fun, particularly for our listenership, uh, is outside. <laughs> um, the company that, uh, well, everybody currently on this podcast at one time worked for. Uh, I have also messaged Robin Thurston, the CEO of Outside, uh, and also not gotten a response. So no confirmation there. But according to our sources, uh, Outside has actually made a bid for the Play Sports Network. So there we have it. GCN, the the sort of hangs in the balance a little bit. Um, I would say companies like this are often sort of like floated around sort of half for sale. But it does sound like this is a, a relatively serious uh, endeavor. And born of, um, frankly, like losing a whole bunch of money in the last couple of years. We were uh, the UK. You guys have like ridiculously transparent finances for companies, which it's it's really I mean, good like, what, for. To, uh, there's a societal benefit to just not having weird money floating around in places. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I was, I was sort of looking up I mean, Place Sports and, and and how <laughs> and how they've been doing. Uh, and yeah, they, they lost. They lost. Uh, five million and then seven million. I think that was in twenty. Oh, were you on? Were you on Company's House? Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, great time there. Which is a fun place to hang out. Mm. Good times. Good times. Uh, so anyway, we we do know that Play Sports Network. Uh, and again, it's it's kind of hard to like parse. <laughs> yeah, which bits of this company were because it's all part of this giant conglomerate, right? Um, but it does appear that it hasn't been particularly profitable in recent years, and that Discovery is uh, looking to move it on. It's it's tough to see how they're going to separate it out because, like, we've got colleagues and friends who are who have recently been employed on the website side of things, like Dan Benson, Matilda Price, Patrick Fletcher, um, and we I guess that makes sense with GCN trying to build out that sort of digital offering a bit more if they know that maybe they're not going to have those rights. But it's kind of, in the past few years, it's kind of become synonymous with the whole thing. Is that that's where you watch your bike racing, and because and like when you having it on your phone in that app is just a game changer instead of having to sit like in the UK, you basically have to sit through loads of adverts for, if you don't have the app for like donkey sanctuaries or like pension <laughs> funds. And it's just like the most depressing thing in the world. Um, so it'd be a big loss. Like I don't, sometimes I find the the whole thing a bit much. I think some other people do, but there's no doubt that they're like a really big part of the ecosystem and the culture. And a lot of people really like the brand. So hopefully everything works out for those people and not the money men. It's often happened that that source of uh, the ability to watch bike racing. Um, you know, for anybody who has come to bike racing in the past three or four years, uh, you might not be aware that five years ago the GCN plus race coverage didn't exist and things like the Tour de Wallonie today uh, you might have seen on Eurosport, but you might not. Uh, and certainly things like you know, GP for me's over the weekend or uh, whatever whatever it might be, uh, the countless other races that are not at World Tour level or even some of the World Tour races that aren't at Grand Tour or Monuments level that we now can sit down and watch if we so choose. Um, removing that option, it's, it's probably one of those things we don't realize what we have until it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I I think train coming by. You have trains where you are. Yeah, what? yeah we, have a, we have a narrow gauge steam train. What? To, what to what's Silver, a steam train do? What for tourists goes, or? Yeah, it's for tourists. It's for tourists. Uh, it, like it's a coal powered 
you know, spews. Anyway, we have we have aeroplanes here, Johnny. They're like trains, <laughs> but they go in the sky. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I do I, I do have a point. I think I think you're 100 percent right, Ronan. I think if this goes away, we're going to sort of realize what, what we have lost. I, I would argue that GCN Plus. So I'm, I'm not talking about the YouTube channel which is where all this started, right? It started as a YouTube channel funded actually by YouTube and Google um, in, in its very, very, very early days when Simon Ware first founded it um, with people like Simon Richardson and Dan Lloyd and, and Matt Stevens. Th- those are sort of the original crew, right? And some of them are still around. Uh, I'm talking about the modern version where it's become where we watch all of our live racing and we watch these, these you know, you can watch all the small races, you can watch the big races. They they do genuinely a very good job of sort of the, the, the show before and after. They... Uh, you know, I think GCN at this point has probably done more to grow sort of the sport of professional road racing in English language markets than anything else in the last half decade, probably anything else in quite some time, uh, because it's just so much easier to watch, right? It's just so much easier to go watch all the races you want to go watch. And we recommend all the time, like, forget Flow Sports, forget NBC, go get yourself a VPN and watch GCN because you're going to have access to everything you could possibly want to have access to. Um and they just do a, a much better job. So I think that's why this is an important story for us to keep an eye on because it, it, it is very relevant to everybody out there who watches a lot of bike racing. Uh, and, I, it, you know, it, it is kind of concerning for me that, that we would potentially lose access to, to some of that, uh, yeah, to some of that, that incredible live coverage that we've kind of come to, to expect over the last couple of years. I mean, you don't have to go that far. You don't have to go back that far in the U.S., to get to like, you get one hour of Tour de France coverage once a week on Sunday, you know, like that we could end up back there at some point. Uh, if NBC decides it doesn't want to do this anymore and GCN is split off and, you know, we could be in a bit of a heyday for, for live coverage that we don't really know about. And I think that's, you know, if, if, if I'm honest with myself as well, I think as good as GCN has been over the last couple of years, the question has always been lingering in the back of my mind is like, how is it this good for this sport? Um, you know, it's not a huge sport. Um, mm. Hearing about the losses GCN were suffering there is a bit worrying also, but it kind of all feels a bit like the, I don't know, the British continental racing scene of, uh, of, of the past decade or so. It's like at, at a certain point, there was riders turning down pro contracts with, Pro Continental or World Tour teams because they were getting paid more with the Continental level teams in Britain, and that just was not a model that could be sustainable. And I was a long time saying this is all going to go bang at some point, and uh, I think I got to the point where I was starting to think, well, maybe I was wrong, maybe this is sustainable. But as we see now, unfortunately, it was not sustainable, um, and hopefully that's not the case with us. Hopefully, GCN's package here is sustainable um, because, as you say, Kelly what they've done for English language, you know, there, no matter what else happens in the world of cycling, if there is not somewhere that you can go and watch races on an almost daily basis, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if the, if the coverage isn't there, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that comes back to what we do as well. If the coverage isn't there, um, you know, does a tree falling in the woods make a noise if nobody's there to hear it? <laughs> that that right. kind of thing. So exactly, exactly. Well, we'll, we'll keep you apprised of anything else we hear on this. Uh, again, the, the, you know, sources indicate this is it's pretty pretty early stages, and and there's essentially there's a couple, a couple potential buyers kind of floating around. Again, we have got outside, we've got potentially the original founder Simon. Um, yeah, our sources indicate that that they are, you know, they're seriously the 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 sale is is sort of very likely to go forward at some point. We just don't know exactly where it's going to end up and what the exact details are. And again, the details are the key here. And if I had to, if I was a betting man. Uh, I would guess that those TV rights stay with Discovery. And so Play Sports Network is basically what's being sold is the YouTube channel and the new website that they launched quite recently under, uh, yeah, our, our friend and, and former colleague, Dan Benson, who's doing a phenomenal job over there. Um, that's my guess. But that is, at the moment, mostly a guess. Uh, we are not going to do a weekly pain today. The... Standings remain. Uh, it's it's the international break. Last week uh, painful. Nice. <laughs> Too much news. <laughs> Too much news. Too much news. International break. Uh, we're gonna we're we're holding off. Uh, just to remind everybody, the current standings. Kit is in the lead 
with five points. Dane and Johnny tied on four. Ian on one. Ronan still at zero. Sad for I you. I want to recount. <laughs> Sad I'm, for you. Dane's going to Jonas Vingago you, Kit. He's just going to steamroll right over the top and take the top spot. I'm going to be Roglic. I'm going to be peacefully waiting. Happy with the podium. Speaking of that, Dane actually just posted something from the Yumbo Visma team. We should we should maybe finish on this this note. Uh, a quote from Jonas Vingo from today's stage after we just sort of ripped him for for being mean to our little Sep. Uh, he did say, "I wanted to win for my best friend Nathan. This victory is for him." So I think that given that context, we can somewhat allow for the uh the chasing of a stage win today i think that that is a, a noble pursuit perhaps but um i still think that if if they end up taking this one away from sep on the angleroo that it's that there's going to be some unhappy fans out there and with that we're going to wrap up thanks for listening to today's episode head over to escapecollective.com slash join if you are not already a member or a reader remember you got to be a member to jump into our private discord present some mysteries for us or email Johnny with your uh, your philosophical questions, your internal anything. debates, anything, whatever you want to send. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Today's correct answers are Mikel Lander, Michelle Reese, Larry Warbus, Luis Leon Sanchez, and Damiana Caruso.